Welcome to this NLD Referee Society presentation on the new law directives ahead of the 2019-2020 season issued by World Rugby. This is presented by Mike Mulroy, the Society Training Officer with content from World Rugby. Now all of this information that does appear on the World Rugby website, it is put here just for ease for our members to collate all the information into one place. A link to the World Rugby PDF on the High Tackle Sanction Guidelines will be sent to all members as well ahead of the season. So the High Tackle Framework has been introduced quite recently by World Rugby and it's new guidance when we're assessing High Tackle and the sanctions that we are to impose. Please now take some time to watch this video from World Rugby which will explain exactly what we need to be doing as referees and then we'll talk about it more in the community game setting that we'll be interested in once the video has finished. World Rugby's decision-making framework for high tackles is a step-by-step -step guide to distinguish between dangerous tackles that warrant a penalty, yellow card or red card. It is a guideline applied by match officials and disciplinary personnel to ensure clear, consistent and accurate officiating and sanctioning and an education tool for players, coaches, media and fans. This framework underpins World Rugby's objective of reducing the risk of head injuries by stimulating player behaviour change from high-risk tackle situations towards safer and lower tackle technique. How does it work? When considering a potential high tackle, match officials must first determine whether the tackle is a shoulder charge or a high tackle. To do this, they must look at the position of the tackler's contact arm at the moment of contact with the ball carrier. This example is a shoulder charge because the contact arm is behind the tackler's body at contact. In this example, the tackler's arm is in front of his body so it is a high tackle. Depending on whether the match officials are dealing with a shoulder charge or a high tackle, they must ask a series of questions to determine the sanction. First, let's look at the example of a shoulder charge. If dealing with a shoulder charge, the first question the match officials must ask is whether there is any contact between the tackler's shoulder and the head or neck of the tackled player. In this example, there is clear head contact, recognised as per the definition for head contact. Here is an example of a shoulder charge where there is no contact to the head or neck of the ball carrier. Next, the officials must determine the degree of danger. In this example, there is a high degree of danger indicated by the tackler leaves the ground, a dominant tackle attempt and both players at high speed. A high degree of danger without head or neck contact means the initial decision would be a yellow card. If the officials decide the degree of danger is low, the initial decision would be a penalty. In our other shoulder charge example, the degree of danger is automatically assumed to be high because contact is direct to the tackled player's head. In this situation, the initial decision would be a red card. Once an initial decision has been made, the match officials must ask whether there are any aggravating or mitigating factors. The following possible factors may be present, but they must be clear and obvious in order for the sanction to be reduced. In this example, both players are in space and the tackler has a clear line of sight prior to the tackle, so aggravating factors are present. There are also no clear and obvious mitigating factors, therefore the final decision remains a yellow card. In this example, there are no clear and obvious mitigating factors, so the final decision remains a red card. Let's look at some more examples, this time of high tackles. The first step for the match officials is to determine whether the high contact is a shoulder charge or a high tackle, using the definition provided for a shoulder charge. If they have eliminated a shoulder charge, then they are dealing with a high tackle and must ask the following four questions to decide on the appropriate sanction. 
Let's look at some examples that would be sanctioned as high tackles. The first question should be, is the high contact from the tackler's shoulder, head, arm or elbow? In this example, there is direct contact to the tackled player's head from the shoulder of the tackler. The match officials then ask, what is the degree of danger? In this tackle, the degree of danger is high, indicated by a dominant tackle attempt, the tackler accelerates into contact, and the tackler completes the tackle. For a high degree of danger, the initial decision would be a red card. If the officials deem the degree of danger to be low, the initial decision would be a yellow card. In this example, the contact to the tackled player's head is from the upper arm of the tackler. The second question is whether the head or neck contact is direct or indirect. In this example, the head contact is direct. The match officials then ask, what is the degree of danger? In this tackle, the degree of danger is high, indicated by a dominant tackle attempt, the tackler accelerates into contact, and the tackler completes the tackle. For a high degree of danger, the initial decision would be a red card. If the officials deem the degree of danger to be low, the initial decision would be a yellow card. In this example, the degree of danger is high, indicated by a tackler who runs into contact at high speed and who completes the tackle by following through over the top of the ball carrier. Because the tackler's head contact was indirect, moving up after initial contact lower on the tackled player's body, the initial decision for high degree of danger is a yellow card. In tackles where the degree of danger is low, the initial decision would be a penalty. Once their initial decisions have been made, the match officials must then ask whether there are clear and obvious aggravating or mitigating factors. In this example, there are no clear or obvious mitigating factors. Therefore, the initial decision of a red card remains. Here, the ball carrier has ducked and is running in a low crouched position immediately before contact to the head occurs. The tackler may therefore be considered to be aiming low enough to avoid the head unless the ball carrier dropped suddenly in height, as may be deemed to occur here. The officials may find this sufficient mitigation to reduce the sanction from a red card to a yellow card. Therefore, the final decision after applying mitigation is a yellow card. Here the players are in open space. The tackler has clear line of sight and time before contact, and so aggravating factors exist. Therefore, no mitigation should be applied and the decision remains at a yellow card. Let's take a look at some more examples. In this sequence, we see two tackles. The first is a high tackle because the arm of the tackler is in front of his body at contact and then makes contact with the ball carrier's head. The second tackle is a shoulder charge because the tackler's right arm on the contact side is behind his body at the moment of contact with the ball carrier. The officials must therefore evaluate one high tackle and one shoulder charge. For the high tackle, the first question is which part of the tackler makes contact with the head of the ball carrier. In this case, it's the tackler's arm. The next question is whether the head contact is direct or indirect. Here we clearly see the contact from the arm to the head is direct. The officials next evaluate the degree of danger. Here, the danger level is high because the tackler's arm is moving forward prior to the contact and the tackler completes the tackle. As a result of the direct arm to the head with high danger, the initial decision would be a red card. Let's look at the second tackle in this sequence, which we have deemed to be a shoulder charge because the player's arm is behind the body at the point of contact. The first question for a shoulder charge is whether there is contact to the head or neck of the tackled player. In this example, it's clear the shoulder strikes the head directly. According to the framework, this would result in an initial decision of a red card, because a shoulder charge to the head is automatically deemed to be high in danger. Once their initial decisions have been made, the match officials must decide whether any clear and obvious aggravating or mitigating factors apply. Here, the officials may deem the low height of the ball carrier, along with the bent position of the tackler at contact, to be mitigation against a red card. They may decide to lower the sanction by one and award a yellow card as the final decision. Similar aggravating or mitigating factors may be applied for the shoulder charge example, depending on the official's discretion. 
they may deem the follow-through of the tackle and use of the shoulder to be sufficient to count against mitigation, and thus remain with the initial decision of a red card. Another type of high tackle occurs where there is no direct or indirect contact with the tackled player's head. As always, the match officials begin by evaluating whether they are dealing with a shoulder charge or a high tackle. Here, it is clear it's a high tackle because the definition of a shoulder charge is not met. The contact is from the arm of the tackler and there is no shoulder involvement. The officials now ask the four questions for high tackles. For question one, the high contact is from the arm of the tackler. Question two asks whether the high contact is direct or indirect. In this case, we see no head or neck contact at any stage during the tackle, so it is considered high but without head contact. The official's third question is whether the degree of danger is high or low. For a tackle that does not involve head or neck contact, the degree of danger will automatically be low. The initial decision would be a penalty. The final step is to ask whether any aggravating or mitigating factors are clearly and obviously present. In the example, there are no such factors and the initial decision of a penalty remains. Had the referee deemed there to be clear and obvious mitigation, the decision would be to play on. This is an example of a seatbelt tackle and completes the set of possible high tackle scenarios. Let's look at one more high tackle example to revisit the process from start to finish. Here we see a high tackle because the tackler's arm is not in a sling position, nor is it behind the tackler's body at impact. We thus exclude a shoulder charge, where the right arm makes contact with the ball carrier in a high tackle. This means the match officials must ask the four questions. First, they must ask which part of the tackler makes the high contact. Here we see the tackler's upper arm strikes the neck of the ball carrier. The second question is whether neck contact is direct or indirect. In this case, the upper arm to neck contact is direct, even though the tackler's right arm is held lower and makes contact with the ball carrier's body. The primary high contact happens direct to the ball carrier's neck. Third, they ask whether the degree of danger is high or low. Because the tackler is accelerating into the tackle, is attempting a dominant tackle, and completes the tackle, the degree of danger is high. Using the framework, this example of an arm direct to the head or neck with a high degree of danger would result in an initial decision of a red card. The officials now assess whether any clear and obvious aggravating or mitigating factors are present. The body position of the ball carrier may be deemed to be a possible mitigating factor. However, this needs to be clear and obvious and also weighed against the fact that the tackler is in open space with a clear line of sight and time to make a tackle that avoids high contact. Therefore, there is insufficient reason for mitigation and the initial decision of a red card is upheld. Through thorough education and consistent on-field management, World Rugby hopes that player and coach culture will change, having a positive impact on injury prevention. So that's quite a complex uh, series of events that uh, match officials need to go through. And clearly, in those cases, they are reviewed by not just uh, on-field officials, the referee, two assistant referees, but also the TMO, which we aren't going to get. On occasion, you will have a, a team of three working, um, particularly at finals, but uh, certainly not with the TMO. So that d decision making process is, uh, is much more acute, really, uh, within the community game. Uh, and it's worth watching that video through two or three times just to get clear in your own mind. The first thing really is to have a look and see shoulder charge or is it a, a high tackle? And then you can follow through uh, all the other questions that you need to ask and whether there's a high degree of danger. Now, this uh, PDF on decision making framework for high tackles will come out to everybody. So you'll be able to see it much more clearly than you do on the video. 
uh, and uh, please do keep a copy of that with you. Uh, visit it every so often just to make sure that you are fully aware. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, to get in touch with us. You can either see us at one of the training sessions or you can email nldreftraining at gmail.com. Moving on to the scrum engagement, an amendment to law 19 that came out this summer uh, against the pre-loading or the axle loading of front row players. Um, this normally takes place with the hooker one or both of them, as you can see circled in the picture, uh, where he places his head on, on the shoulders of the opponent, uh, but also pushes uh, and uh, some weight through that. Um, and the weight of the pack comes through onto that neck which gives not just a weight and power advantage but is clearly uh, potentially dangerous so if we look at that a little more closely you can see the uh, the white hooker there never mind the the angles of all the other players but the white hooker is clearly putting all of his weight and the weight of the pack through his neck uh, whereas the blue hooker is now forced to to put his head on the shoulder but if you look at the neck positions there certainly doesn't seem to be any weight loading going through there uh, and that's that's the key um, once one does it invariably because of the body positions the other one will be forced to have a head on shoulder so you must be quite clear on this and you can see a little bit uh, better on the on the close-up uh, picture there so managing this well um, it's it comes down to a lot of briefing and early pre-season games have shown this could be a potential issue but we might see uh, a way of managing it as long as there is no weight going through uh, in the future so make sure that we we cover this in our pre-match briefing we want keep off the heads obviously we don't want head on head and you want daylight between the two packs so you want that space between the shoulders at all points which relies on the the props now to uh, push each other away rather than to start pulling on before the set uh, one of the ways to, to often spot this is that the hooker, as you can see, the white hooker there, takes a slightly different angle with, the, with their arms and starts leaning forward, which pulls the weight of their props with them. Um, you can see this particularly in, uh, in age grade, um, where the hooker starts to pull forward. If you do age grade rugby, you'll probably recognise this and be able to carry that forward to adult rugby as well. Um, just again mention to them, no preloading keep your weight off all the way through wait for my calls so in terms of what we do well in first let's stop and talk uh, and have a chat again uh, depending on the level of the game obviously as you've seen in some of the other presentations uh, and sessions that we did pre-season uh, and just uh, give them a gentle reminder um, the book definition is it's a free kick but as always if you have to then we will be uh, we will be escalating that sanction for repeat offences so they're the two things that we are looking at pre-season um, from World Rugby. Please make yourself well aware of these before you start uh, your season. Uh, again, any questions, do give us a shout um, and we will do our very, very best to help you. I'm sure there are going to be plenty of questions about this and evidence coming up in the first two months of the season. And as that comes to light, we will be bringing that to you uh, both at, uh, at training sessions, but also on the YouTube channel. Thank you very much for watching. Please watch uh, again. Please look at the, uh, the high tackle framework again uh, a couple more times and we look forward to seeing you at the next session.